So welcome, Carol Gold. You are a professor of philosophy and distinguished senior researcher at the Center for Future Mind at uh, Florida Atlantic University. Mm -hmm. And that sounds like a very fascinating project. Would you like to tell us more, not bureaucratically, but more philosophically, what what is a future mind and why should we care for the future of the mind? Well, um, I think because it's in if it may be in great transformation, significant transformation. Um, this center was started quite recently by uh, a philosopher of mind in AI uh, who um, came to FAU. She's half in the Brain Institute, half in philosophy, and I've had many discussions with her about, you know, AI, and she's a transhumanist. So, you know, we've discussed that quite a bit, but I'm interested in it too, because one of the things I work on is aesthetic properties of persons, which is a concept that I've been developing. I've developed it in a number of articles and it's um, uh, developing it more in my, in a book I'm writing right now on glamour, which I see as an internal, not an external, uh, more theatrical concept, which it's usually associated with. But I connect it, I'm, I'm developing a concept that um, actually goes back to the original meaning of it, which had to do with witchcraft or concealment, secret knowledge and so forth. And so I, I'm develop I have a distinction between true glamour and false glamour. I, I actually wrote about it a, a long time ago and then it kind of, came back to me is something I, you know, and I had new ideas about. And um, then I started, as I was thinking about it, I wondered, well, could an, an AI entity have glamour or have charisma or have any of these other aesthetic properties that we might attribute to person? Um, could, and, and in a way this connects to something that you're interested in, Luis, because you're interested in improvisation as am I. And I'm also interested in, well, the mind, and I'm very interested in the notion of philosophical health, which is the concept that you introduced and the idea of, well, actually the idea of health and also mental health, because I work in philosophy of psychiatry as well as these other areas. So all of these things tie into mind. I'm, I'm very interested in connecting some concepts and aesthetics with um, AI and, and so forth. But um, to get back to philosophical health, uh, I think it's a fascinating concept. And one reason is, is that in philosophy of medicine, and I know that you're a medical humanist, but in philosophy of medicine, one of the chief questions is what is health? You know, because it's been defined in, in different ways. What does it mean for a person to be healthy? Is it based on some statistical norm? You know, like an Aristotelian middle form or, or is it based on some kind of concept of flourishing? And by the way, you asked about the Center for Future Mind and one of the, um, one of the driving forces is uh, an attempt to understand human flourishing. So is, is health more than just meeting the statistical average or being um, uh, an adequate functioning specimen of a species? You see, I mean, so there's some very interesting questions there. And so when we talk about philosophical health, well, of course we have two different ideas here. What is philosophy, of course? <laughs> um, and then what is health? And I think that um, when I was getting acquainted with your concept, these are questions that were going through my mind. And, and one of the things that you pointed out, of course, in an interview, I can't remember who it was with, uh, forgive me, but you pointed out that philosophers have, different philosophers <laughs> have different concepts of what philosophy is and what, what are we doing? Um, I believe you were the one who pointed it out. And um, so, we have that, but I think I think you and I can probably um, 
adopt a sort of intuitive notion, and I think we probably agree on what philosophy is. Um, but I do think this question of health is important. And I think especially as philosophical practitioners, it's something that could be explored. Mm. This is interesting because in what you said, and it's it's very rich, but I can see the the um, uh, curious and, and uh, playful attempt to unify all that through the idea of health, for example, and the idea of measurement to which you refer to via statistics. I would argue that biomedicine today have nothing to say about health. That's not their business. They are in the business of illness and absence of illness. Those things can be measured. While the idea of health that I'm trying to develop is not one that can be measured. Indeed, as you were saying, it's about flourishing. It's about our participation to the creative flow and I, and I think we'll say more about that because you are a musician and I'm very curious to uh, to hear you, <laughs> uh, how you connect uh, music with with philosophy so I'm quite um, surprised that the idea of a future mind is attributed to the responsibility of a transhumanist that is actually a little bit uh scary for me i don't know her so maybe she's a she's a lovely well, she's person much more than, she's much more than a transhumanist actually yeah. I, I find her quite quite um extraordinary because she deals with and she consults with some national um very important national organizations like congress on the ethics of ai mm. and you know, which I think, so she's broad, but, you know, we've talked a little bit about transhumanist and, mm -hmm. um, but if I may just, since this is improvisational, as you, or at least you said in the beginning, if I may just go back to one thing you said about the uh, domain of the biomedical seems to be more um, uh, disease in the absence of disease or illness in the absence of illness, I think you put it. Um, I think all too many people in medicine define health as the absence of disease. Exactly. Would you agree with that? Yeah. And I yes, think that's what I meant. And I, and I think that's, of course, a problematic um, definition, right? Uh, because that equates uh, health with measurements and therefore with norm. Mm -hmm. And one thing that um, I am attempted to to, to convey with this idea of philosophical health, why it's needed in complement to physical and psychological health is that these two previous forms of health uh, are increasingly being uh, equated with, with uh, measured forms of life, right? Uh, and, and that is not only um, evident in the biomedical realm, but also it is slowly um, invading our lives, our existences, and the way we see each other, right? We see each other uh, uh, through metrics, through uh, what I call sometimes arithmetic mania, right? Uh, okay. And so uh, when we are talking about um, health as a relationship to to a creative flow that is not only anthropocentric there um it connects more to practices like music which with which you're familiar uh with and the way we it's worth saying here that the way we connected we were at the conference together uh on philosophical counseling and um, I, I alluded to the importance of uh, improvisation uh, as a uh, as a existential attitude, and I, of course, the, the the first example, the first metaphor that comes to mind is uh, within jazz, and then someone, um, I think it was uh, our uh, dear friend. Um, uh, Elliot, right? Elliot Cohen, 
uh, mention uh, classical music. And, and, uh, and, uh, and I said, well, I think that even in classical music, there's the example of Baroque music, but there is an element of, of improvisation that is perhaps less evident. And uh, you seem to agree with that. And I would like to, to know more since you are, I believe, um, I, by the way, what, what is your main instrument? Is it? Um, well, it has been cello. I mean, I right. study other, but, and, and actually with all of my work at the university, you know, I didn't have as much time. Things were just getting so crazy, <laughs> you know, so I, but I, I, studied it for decades i mean decades really um many and um you know when time permitted i would practice five hours a day you know and so forth i also played flute for a while and loved that too but i i couldn't do both you know you can't mm -hmm. do both right well at least i couldn't i'm not that kind of musician right. and um i but i but i love i love the cello and um, actually, I, I have an, an article, it's an old article that I wrote um, uh, about improvisation and classical music, because I think it's an incredibly important um, element of it. I think it is in all the arts. I mean, one an another art that I'm quite interested in is, um, is painting, um, you know, not just the visuals, but painting in particular. And, and of course, you and I both write. Um, so we know how improvisational the arts are. Um, but with regard to music, I think that whenever we act, we're always interacting with our environment, we're reacting. Um, and part of that environment, since you asked about music, is the sound that we produce. Um, now, you're a jazz musician, as I understand it, or? No, I'm an amateur musician, um, not at all um, regularly practicing. Uh, you know, as you, as you mentioned, and that is something very important that we can uh, uh, dive into a little bit more. It's very difficult to do various different things very well in, in the matter that really express some form of singularity. So when I was um, 17, I, on the one hand, I was playing music, composing songs, etc. Oh. On the other hand, I was writing already. And, and I thought, okay, will I, will I go more into the music way of expression or more into the writing? And I decided to go into writing and I sort of uh, therefore not killed, it's a little bit dramatic if I say I killed the musician in me because I still play for myself or for my daughter or once in a while I or take the guitar. But, um, but indeed, I think what you said about the cello, and I would like to hear more about that, uh, because I think there is an echo to philosophical health in the world where, especially the Western world, we are presented with so many choices, so many possible selves. And a lot of people in consultation, uh, I see them even at 40 or 50, they are still lost in this idea that they can be many selves at the same time and they want to be this and that. And, and it seems that many of us have forgotten this the uh, the uh, the salubrity of less is more of pruning of of focusing on on one skill and 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 finding diversity within one art and so uh, that there is this superficiality right of of wanting to to do a little bit of everything and in the end uh, perhaps not doing anything and I think that is that is very re related to one aspect. Uh, of uh, philosophical health, which is the courage to to be a minimalist in certain way, but but in another way that minimalism is is uh, extremely rich, right? It's a relationship with all the possibilities that a a practice offers. 
Yes, I, I would agree with that. I think that one has to, one is best when one focuses. And that's why I mean, I'm not a professional cellist by any stretch of the imagination, even my most active. I mean, I've been a philosopher and I made that decision, you know, it, at one point um, myself, you know, because I was also, um, I mean, I never uh, had any plans to do, um, uh, to do music professionally. It was never in the cards for me. And um, I didn't have the kind of training. I didn't have that. Kind of, but for me, it's something that enriched my philosophical life. And also at times was a form of meditation. Um, but as you know how that can be. Um, but it was still, I st still a very important part of my life. And um, even when I don't have a lot of time to practice. And that's why I say, I mean, for a while, my university obligations, especially when you have lots of committees and things like that, became uh, just consumed so much time. And, uh, but I also believe that if you want to do something um, that isn't your, say, let's take it out of the professional realm or something that is your chief focus, if you do it a little bit, even a little bit, I should say, preferably more every day, you know, it does, uh, you, you, it does remain part of you, integrated into your identity. And um, I think that with uh, one of the things that I loved about the cello, um, which made me choose that, uh, is that, well, first of all, is uh, a member of the violin family, you know, it doesn't have frets. And so you really have to, learning has a lot to do with learning sound. And it has a lot to do with trying to achieve a certain tone and also to all being well to play in tune. <laughs> and I mean, that, that's critical, which is harder. You know, you, you, you learn it, you do it, but you also realize that when you're playing in certain keys, the notes are just a little bit different. You know, that's something that people don't, you know, non uh, music musicians might not realize. And that actually over the centuries, what, what's called a certain note today was a little bit different. Um, for example, right now in, in the A, the standard A um, is uh, 440, is actually a teeny bit higher. And because of those raises and pitches, you know, these old instruments have had to be modified over time and uh, which I find fascinating, you know, mm -hmm. to me, these are all conceptual things too, because it raises the issue of, you know, well, what, what does it mean for someone to have perfect pitch, for example, um, you know, and so forth. But I just loved the, um, I mean, I even like playing scales. <laughs> I like just playing open strings and listening to the possibilities of sound. But alas, um, I haven't, I've been focusing mainly on my work as a philosopher and on my writing. And like you, I believe that we have to, we have to be focused, we have to be minimalist. And, um, you know, it's, it's hard. Now I've noticed that you have written on a wide array of things and uh, which I'm impressed with. I think that's great because, but I also got the impression that you were able to, you must, and from having seen of, of your work, what I have, which is not a lot, but a little, um, you know, you can, you can focus very closely on something and then sh switch focus to something else if need be, just as we do if we're teaching, say, you know, I can sometimes incorporate my research into my teaching, um, but, um, you know, you kind of have to switch gears along the way. Now, just to go back very briefly to, to music, if I may, um, I'd say that nothing has perhaps enriched or enlightened me in teaching philosophy as studying music has. I think they're very similar, very, very similar, because in both cases, you really don't get the point until you've been doing it for quite a while. 
Would you agree with that? Can you tell us? Can you tell us more? In what ways are they similar? Well, because there's certain things that people can tell you. Actually, it's a little like psychoanalysis too. <laughs> you know, um, a, a, um, a teacher, uh, um, um, an analyst, whatever can explain something to you. But it's not until you practice it that you come to see what they're talking about. In fact, it might not be until years later that you really understand it. Um, and I think the same is true with philosophy. And so you really have to think very closely about how you present principles. As you do, if you're working with someone in a, as a philosophical practitioner. And so I, I, and I think that's true. I was thinking about the concept of philosophical health. Um, what is it for a human being to flourish? What is it for a human being to gain understanding, which of course is the Socratic notion of philosophical health, I think. Would you agree with that? I was wondering um, two things here. The first is, since you spoke about the similarity between music and philosophy, I, I thought you were going to this idea of attunement, mm -hmm. which yes. I, I find very interesting uh and which relates with the second point on uh personal flourishing lately i've been thinking the following um and that is related to uh my creolactic cosmology uh, we don't have to get into the details here but just to say that uh, the fact that i'm able to write uh hopefully uh uh meaningfully about different topics in appearance is that i apply to them this over and over the same cosmology mm -hmm. uh, whether it's ai or ne or, or neon signs as a metaphor for identity or so uh so there is a, a, a an appearance of diversity but in the end it's 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 the same cosmology and via the lens of that cosmology i've been lately very lately i'm, I'm finishing a a chapter for for a book i'm editing on philosophical health and i realized we can we cannot satisfy ourselves only with this idea of personal flourishing uh today in the world that is uh, as we know uh, more and more globalized and where uh, humans and non-humans are in constant uh, interweaving. So there is this notion of attunement, even sometimes I would say interspecies attunement. But by species, I mean not only, uh, you know, cats or, or feline or uh, I'm not a biologist, but, uh, but in fact, anything of the realm of the other that I, it might not have necessarily been identified as a species. Uh, and so this idea of attunement, I find it rather musical, right? As is the, uh, the metaphor of harmony, right. which has been used uh, very often uh, in, in politics. So I suppose that uh, in your relationship with music, there are various levels. There's probably the simple level where just the fact of sitting and with your cello and, and, and playing something is a form of meditation. And then at another level, I suppose that when you're trying to harmonize ideas, for me, it is it echoes the idea of a composer trying to, to harmonize notes. Is that your experience? Well, I would say so. I, I haven't done composition, but what I have done is um, chamber music quite a bit. And of course, you're always reacting to the other when you're playing chamber music, or you should be. Hmm. <laughs> there's not, be, not going to be much attunement or harmony. Um, and uh, which is ideal. I mean, you, you know, if you want to sort of have a, a musical conversation, which is partly what chamber music is about. I think uh, analogy with philosophical conversation. 
um, it's uh, the same way. And even if you have a score, say you're playing uh, a sonata with uh, someone, like a, if I'm playing a sonata with a pianist, um, it, you know, there is, um, in, in a sense, uh, you have to be attuned to what others are saying, but you also want to attain a kind of unification. Does that make sense to you? And so if, if two people are play, have diff, very different approaches to playing, sometimes it just doesn't work. Um, and I mean, I don't mean approaches intellectually, but I mean, you can just hear them. Um, and I think that that's, you know, that's one thing that makes it exciting. And it's always improvisational, always. Right, so there's this dialectic between yeah. Uh, improvisation, creation, attunement, and on, on the other hand, a, uh, a sense of unity that needs to be created. And that actually echoes the, um, the existential biography that one might think uh, may be enhanced by philosophical counseling. So you have uh, tell me more about your relationship to philosophical counseling uh, in the past, present, and future. Well, actually, I would say it's more in the past and the future because I haven't, I'm just reviving my practice. And in fact, I'm, uh, I had been certified by the APPA um, at both the individual and the corporate level. And uh, when I had my practice uh, some years ago, um, I worked very closely with the CEO, but it was more on an individual level, but I actually did help him. Oddly enough, this is an, a strange outcome of it, but I actually helped him develop a product, <laughs> which, <Right. laughs> which was a surprise, but he was really interested in trying to trying to articulate a worldview. And he had a worldview and he was quite confident with it. He wanted me, he said, to knock down his ideas so he could rebuild them and so forth. But you see, his ideas really weren't sufficient. And I think this guy, by the way, is a brilliant man. Okay, so he's, I'm not, you know, but his ideas philosophically were not even developed enough to quote, knock down. Do you see? So right. I was helping him develop ideas. And one of the ideas, we, he was talking about the various components of life. He wanted a philosophy of life. And um, which I thought was admirable for someone who is a you know, kind of CEO, a very, uh, I'd say, well, yeah, driven, let's say driven, certainly conscientious. Uh, responsible, um, excited about what he was doing. And um, his company has done well. It's um, based here in, in this area of Florida. And he, um, but he was interested, one of the components of life is love. And he had this formulaic idea of it. And which I found interesting. And so we worked on that a lot. And he found that as he um, would throw out an idea or what he thought was an essential component, and we would, I would ask him to define it or what he thought, he, he was somewhat stymied by it. He, he didn't quite know where to go with it. And we worked for quite a long time on developing a philosophy of love that he was, and, and I too was comfortable with because, well, maybe we had different views because I don't think it can, I, I think a reductionist theory of love is impossible. You know, I, I don't think that one can um, exhaustively define it mm -hmm. um, or analyze it. I think mm -hmm. that there's always, some little speck that's, you know, that indefinable. And uh, so 
but we we worked on that for a very long time and he um i i think that he he learned a lot and learned a lot about himself and learned a lot about his relationships and and actually i i too <laughs> did um in in doing this work but i think that and and by the way i think that he attained but that wasn't the only concept we worked on, but I think that he attained some kind of measure of philosophical health in becoming more responsive, more deeply responsive to the world and to the people in his life, his family, say. Um, uh, he was, uh, you know, he was a serious person, but he, you know, he, he also, and, and he actually had a great um, kind of passion for philosophy, which surprised me, but he didn't quite know where to go with it. And um, so I found that now he was, he was one of my most important clients, I would say. Um, I didn't know what to expect working with someone like that. I didn't know if this was, he was more interested in um, kind of solving problems, maybe ethical problems or or definitional problems with his goals or or what. But he mm -hmm. turned out to be just profoundly interested in having and let's let's call it flourishing, you know, in the philosophical sense. Mm -hmm. um, there were some a couple of clients I worked with who. Um, who I felt really needed more medical treatment than, you know, than we as philosophical practitioners are. Right. May I, I interrupt you here and ask, because we all know, for example, uh, I don't know, as you were talking, uh, uh, Lacan's philosophy, uh, definition of love came to my mind. Uh, love is giving uh, what you don't have to someone who doesn't want it. Uh, but what is what is your definition of love then oh my definition of love well i think that there's certain elements to it certain um if, uh, well this is a question i certainly didn't expect but um and uh and and actually love is something i have written on as a philosopher um because i think that first of all it has a lot to do with um, appreciating a person as an individual, seeing the person as irreplaceable, um, even if you have more than one love, um, you know, you can, you still see each person as, or, or the, your significant other or whoever it happens to be, or a child or whatever. But to really love someone, I think, is to see them as utterly different from anyone else. You know, sui generis, one of a kind, more unique than rare. And if you have a definition or if you have necessary and sufficient conditions for love, that's uh, inconsistent with being able to see that person as unique and to see your relationship to them as unique. Because it will be, if you see, if you see a human being as unique in himself or herself, um you can't you're not going to relate to them in quite the same way as you do another person right who or yeah. who has another role like as a parent as a as a child or as a um you know you or as as a lover a spouse um a friend whatever you know because you have a friend that you love and part of what you love is you know something that's utterly irreplaceable um, when you that's why grief I think is um, is so devastating because you know that, that it's a loss that cannot be that cannot be replaced you can never recover that loss because you can't recover that individual person does that make sense to you right the plurality of love and the the singularity of the person singularity. which actually is a very good uh, i'm looking at time here that's my uh 
biomedical uh, uh, <laughs> as facet of an interviewer but um that connects very well with what you said in the beginning and, and transhumanism uh, because i think we are living in a time where there are two competing uh definitions of singularity so the 20th century very french philosophy idea of singularity which is what you said about love it's the uh the uniqueness uh of the person in such way that uh all the um the rules it's a little bit like the singularity of a black hole the laws of nature dissolve and and break that there is their infinite possibility and on the other hand there's this transhumanist idea of singularity which is the machines uh, overcoming humankind etc uh, and i find it interesting per perhaps not for discussion today but how many terms of philosophy are stolen by computer science so uh, singularity is one of them but there is also ontology right which is for philosophers the um discourse on being and it becomes a, 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 tax, uh, a taxonomy, uh, algorithmic taxonomy in, um, uh, in, in computer science. But I would like to um, perhaps slowly start concluding with this idea of unification that you um, refer to. So in one way, people could uh, feel that the idea of philosophical health and the way philosophical counseling can help them is, is by helping them to become a more unified person, uh, a more coherent and consistent person, uh, perhaps a person who indulges less in things that have nothing to do with her, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, and fair enough, and I think that's part of it. But on the other hand, it's the very opposite, I would say. It's also a recognition, at least in my, in my approach, it's a reconnection with the creative impulse of life, the, oh, the sense totally of the possible. Right? Yeah, totally agree with that. Yes, I think that philosophical practice, philosophical, however you want to call it, therapy, counsel, you know, whatever. And if we use the philosophical sense of therapy, and of course, there are many of those, you know, from Plato to Wittgenstein. Um, but if you um, think, I do think it can make one, some would say paradoxically, but I do think it can make one highly creative. It can, it can um, bring out one's creativity, perhaps that one didn't even know was there. I think philosophy is one of the best means for becoming more creative because it helps you, it, it gives you the kind of boldness um, both intellectually, artistically, emotionally, to look at a, an array of possibilities and also to become a more compassionate. And that creativity, I think, is also involved in becoming compassionate towards others, which I think is important too. That's something else that I like to focus on because right. often people who have problems with other people, say a spouse or something, a lot of it has to do with not understanding their uh, um, that person's point of view and perhaps that person's fragility, what Buddha would call, you know, their their suffering. But you know, we're all fragile as human beings, and um, so I think that um, you know a creative view of life doesn't only enhance and improve one's own life in whatever one's pursuit is or just living um, in, as an observer of the world or whatever, but I think it also um, enriches one's relationships, which in turn makes one, if I may use the term, <laughs> uh, happier <laughs> mm. because you can resolve it allows one to resolve sometimes issues people have with others, which is, you know, one of the most problematic aspects of, you know, 
a non-pathological life. I'm talking, let, or I assume we're talking non-pathology here, right. right? Okay. So uh, I don't know what you think of that, but. I think this is extremely interesting. We should have another conversation about that. Um, of course, you knew already before saying it, you, you anticipated that I would react on the word happy, um, I tend to be more Spinozian and use the term joy. It was actually the title of my first novel in French, Joie. Uh, but I, I understand your intention and, and I do agree. You know that uh, a little bit of autobiography here. Uh, I think when I was a teenager and throughout my life, I think the influence of Nietzsche has been really uh, strong. And yeah. because of my let's say the biography of my first 20 years, um, I've become a very resilient person. And so I identified with Nietzsche's idea of great health is like, what doesn't kill me makes me strong, et cetera, right? And, and it is only later in life that I have understood that, not that I think I was a cruel person, but I was a little bit suspicious of um for example empathy i think empathy empathy sometimes causes as much damage as as it helps in other uh, circumstances uh because it's very normative uh there is it's, it's a little bit like hollywood movies they tell you when to cry they 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 tell you when to feel sad when to be there there is a very um uncreative uh training of our emotions sometimes uh, in, in society. However, uh, more recently, uh, and, and I think this is what you were saying, I've also understood that it is extremely brave to be kind, even in the Nietzschean sense, because when you are systematically kind, you also take a lot of uh, adversity, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the acceptance of that adversity is itself something uh, that, that makes uh, one grow. So I, I, I do agree with what you said about, um, uh, if not compassion, at least, uh, I would say kindness. Kindness, yes. Mm. Yeah, understanding. Yeah, because I think understanding the other can free you. It's a form of liberation. Does that, yeah, I don't know if that resonates. But. Yes, um, okay, does it, I mean, it, it seemed obvious to me when I heard it, um, but perhaps my face was showing something else, I don't know. Um, do, we, do we ever, there's, there's, we can be kind without understanding fully the other, but in the end, I agree with you that um, this active understanding, precisely because we are beings in constant creative flow. It's not like the other person is an object fixed there with a spe specific psychology to be understood as an object. Uh, of course, it is that in the act of dialogue and comprehensive dialogue, both are actually creating uh, new identities that reflect each other, right? It's a very intercreative process. So in that aspect, this is why I was a bit hesitant, is that there is, a, there is an understanding which is also a meaning-making process. So it's transformative for, for both parties or, or many if we are a group. Yes, yes, all being well, right? That's ideal. Yeah. If not for the other, if it doesn't, if it doesn't affect the other, it can still help you mm. and still help oneself. And I think that that can be very useful in working with our clients as philosophical practitioners to help them see it as a philosophical health as a form of liberation from negative emotions and right. resentments and so forth. And I thought what you said about empathy though is extremely interesting. 
thought provoking. I'll have to think about it. Mm, yes, and uh, I mean we could develop that. There are actually there there have been studies about that, although studies from the psychological field, which which are always a little bit problematic, because um, they are about uh, very often um, hammering people with questionnaires that are pre-established. I would like to conclude by listening to you and ask you what's your big project for deepest project for the next 10 years <laughs> my deepest project well um i think that one thing is that um i want to continue to to develop some of my ideas in and this uh in a very non-frivolous way, the aesthetics of persons, which I think connects to philosophical health. And it has to do with um, this project that I have going right now on um, uh, glamour and personhood, um, concealment and superficiality of self-presentation and different wave modes of self-presentation, and also to develop um, continue to develop, I hope, as a philosophical practitioner, because I believe in it so strongly as a powerful tool for flourishing. And I'm interested to, I mean, I'm not giving you concrete projects, although I have them in the works, and I um, just finished something in Japanese philosophy that I'm hoping to integrate into all of this. But I'm uh, I'm really hoping to get a deeper understanding of personhood and also to help others. Um, yeah, and, and like you, I'm, I have a profound interest in psychoanalysis. Um, yeah, so that, uh, that may be something I've developed. I'm, you know, one thing that I've become acutely aware of uh is the just the contingency of life and the uncertainty of it and if we can help if we as philosophical practitioners or philosophy professors or just philosophy philosophers who write if we can help people understand that and live with that more comfortably i think we're on a way to flourishing and helping people flourish um, and I do think, though, that we have to confront this world, which is changing so rapidly, thanks to technology and globalization. Although I, I see in Europe and uh, here, too, of course, this movement towards nationalism, which I think, well, I won't go into anything political right now, but, you know, globalization, technology, um, you know, biomedical technology, we have this um, we do have this phenomenon of AI um, <laughs> that has to be dealt with because it's becoming quite salient in almost every area of life. You know, every area from, you know. From Another medicine. challenge for our illusion of normality. I think that that's one of the main uh, um, themes it's of our conversation, right? Uh, if I may, uh, this idea that uh philosophy opens us i believe to the realization that life is needs to be faced in extremis and that the um the sort of um illusion or longing for a domesticated uh, normified life or return to normal uh, which is something we hear a lot in our chaotic world. Well, okay, right now there is this epidemic, but it will return to normal. Oh, right now there is a war, but it it will never return to normal. And actually, perhaps it should not if we embrace the uh, um, limit situation that life is. That is not necessarily one of um, dereliction, suffering. And I'll, I'll perhaps conclude there by saying that a lot of people today who 
discover philosophy they and philosophy as as care or self-care they enter uh, into it through the stoics and there is a lot of cliches about the stoics helping us separate from the world uh distance ourselves from the, the the noise and fury and and this idea that we can attain this ataraxit uh, equilibrium where we no longer uh, feel disturbed i said that's not only dangerous but that's not at all what the stoics said they had very much this vision of the, <laughs> right the fragility and this oh, chaos yeah. That, yeah yeah right so yeah. I'll leave you the last uh, word uh, on this, and then we will wrap it up. Well, okay, the Stoics aside, well, I, I agree with you. I think that they're widely misunderstood. But I was thinking that, um, you know, here's, uh, as, as you were speaking about facing the, this ever-changing world and the uncertainties of it and the precariousness of our lives and the whole ludicrousy of the idea of the normal <laughs> normal life um, that uh, yes I mean if we can help people become more improvisational and uh, more creative or help ourselves be that way and I, I was thinking also if I might just jump back to one thing I said about love you know when um, the uniqueness of of, of, of every of any individual but um if you think about say you as a musician a composer guitarist when if you heard two different equally talented accomplished musicians play one of your pieces say that you had composed you'd hear two very different performances two very different things because we are each so singular particularized and that, and if people can also embrace that in themselves, I think that we as philosophical practitioners can, you know, could achieve marvels because for many people, it's the, uh, you know, it's the attempt to conform, which of course, some of which is necessary, um, but, uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you about this another time. I've been reading uh, an early 20th century social theorist named George Simmel, Georg Simmel, and um, you know how he, which is to some extent, my reactions to that have to some extent um, made me feel this more firmly that we don't appreciate not only the other as a singular being, but ourselves and would you have anything to say about that? Um, I will just, uh, I mean, Simmel makes me think about, um, you wrote a small text. Um, I don't know if it's translated into uh, English. It probably is. Um, I read it into, in French, uh, the philosophy of adventure mm -hmm. or phenomenology of adventure. Mm -hmm. And I think that's that connects with what you said about um, improvisation and and also the uh um curiosity towards the fact that there are many interpretations or variations uh of what may seem at first glance to be over and over and over the same thing and i think what we philosophers are trying to show is that it's over and over and over something different i suggest that um we pause the recording here and uh thank you very much carol oh well thank you Louise. it's been such a pleasure i've learned a lot from our conversation equally